So they asked me to talk about some of the work we've been doing in Ecuador. I say we because actually everything they say is, has been done jointly today. I get to stay in the morning the year that she does, she makes cover trips, but I'm usually there for about three months out of each year. And it's going to be about birds. Managing that was the there. So what we've been doing during long term studies, I say long term going out to 2001. One of the main focuses of the bird communities, what the composition is, how that the patterns of diversity and how these vary across different scales. Uh, how bird population dynamics, numbers of birds, rivalries, how those change over time. And then I'll get into the last part, which is the camera company study that we've been doing since 2004. And this is looking at terrestrial mammals and birds and how those are distributed across the landscape and over time. And then at the end, I'll get into, uh, so this part is a core connection between the two of us. I've also had a couple of students who've been working with camera company in Guyana and Ecuador, and I'll mention their work at the end. So just that John showed you that the river meandering in the previous study, this is the Tipitini River. Uh, this is lowland forest in Ecuador. Quito is so off the screen over that way. We're at about 200 meters elevation. So it's a very meandering river. It's fairly flat all the way out uh, to the Amazon. As you can see, it's basically surrounded by forest. We're just outside of Yosemite National Park, but within the Biosphere Reserve. So the station itself is only about 650 hectares, but there's 2.7 million hectares around the station in the Biosphere Reserve, and that includes the park, as well as uh, indigenous reserves, water running reserves, and other. So that's the Tibutini River. It's a bit different from the Manu. Uh, it has the same pattern of moving around, but we don't have that same pattern of habitat differences that John was showing you for the, the Manu area. So the Tibutini is a lot smaller than the Napo, which is up here. So that's quite a bit more similar to the larger rivers. You see these sandbars uh, forming and so forth. But the Tibutini is much narrower. The river rises and falls fairly rapidly. We don't have much Barzea forest. It's mostly terra firma forest because it's uh, relatively narrow. It's a fairly diverse area, Yasuni National Park. Uh, you've got huge numbers of trees. It's the most diverse of the 50 hectare, 25 hectare forest plots around the world by far. Lots of mammals, lots of amphibians, lots of birds. Uh, Terry Irwin, who's working on coleoptera primarily, but other things through this finding, has come up with these huge estimates of species, just who knows how many. And if you look at distributions of all these different things, uh, any one individual group may be more diverse than somewhere else, but when you put them all together, Yasuni, which is this little green area up there, turns out to basically be the most diverse area in the world. So it's a sort of nice working area. Because there's lots of these things there of all different kinds. Uh, so this has been the major focus of birds. This is the main thing that I work on uh, are birds, and primarily for the last couple of decades, uh, all the in tropical areas. And part of this research was inspired by John's research in Manu because his was the first study to use a large-scale plot to study tropical bird communities. We have been working in um, Costa Rica for many years where we had relatively small plots, bigger than two hectares, but not really large. But we were not going to be able to put large 100-hectare plots with transects into the Salvo Biological Station. Terry Owen convinced us to come to Tikitini and we were able to put in two 100-hectare plots so that's what these are. These are graded. Each of those points is a PVC tube, so we have all these great coordinates on these plots. They're 100 meters apart, the transects going this way, 200 meters that way. So we can see a reference to every bird that we catch or see. One of the two, two impressions I'll have to talk about here, one was it at a local scale, putting in these two plots of both the territory and forest, how similar are they or how different? And they're going to have to experience the same basic regional history, but they're going to be under different local conditions. So what those local conditions might mean, such as habitat structure or the composition of those communities. And then we wanted to do a regional comparison among different sites that have 100 hectare plots. So there's the Cochicachu site down in Peru, which is 1370 kilometers away. French Guiana site with another 100 hectare plot. And Panama, where Scott has been working, Keystone, still working. Yeah, 
another 100 hectare plot put in there later, and there's actually a second one right next to us that Peter English had put in uh, earlier. He's not working there. So at different scales, he wanted to ask the same question, how similar are these plots of prairie communities? How, what's the diversity like across these different scales? We use two different methods for sampling birds, and then the fact of using two methods will become important later. One is mist nets, so we set up mist nets at a whole series of points on each of those plots, capture bird, ban them, let them go, and we do this usually twice a year, January and March for each year. With those recapture data, uh, we can look at survival rates, we can look where we catch them, then look at patterns of distribution within each of those plots, and look at differences between the plots. Mist nets are set in other stories so you catch birds that are low down. So that's about 160 to 100 or so species that we caught, 180 on the two plots combined, and about 16,000 captures over these years. Uh, in contrast, when I'm doing the observations, you're including canopy stuff. So now it's up around 300 species in each of the plots and some 60,000 observations, and all those being geo references to look at patterns of distribution, which basically I'm not going to be talking about. So this was a method that a uh, uh, guy by the name of Pittman used to look at differences in plant community composition. So what I'm doing here are the two different plots, Trapea plot and Kuma, uh, named for the trails, not necessarily for the organisms. Um, <laughs> comparing them, if, and this is looking at numbers of different species per family. John mentioned the Hanford family, that's the family up here, one of the most diverse family. If these points all were on a straight line, that would be equal numbers of species per family in the two different plots. The fact that this slope, actual slope, calculated from these points is one. And the fact that most of these points are close to that line tells me that at a local scale, these two earth communities are very, very similar, at least in terms of numbers of species per family. It gets a little different if you look at individual species. Now, things like this guy, which is the screaming piha, has a very large lek on one plot and is absent from the other. This orapendula up there has a bigger colony on one plot than on the other. But all these guys up here are practically equally common on both plots. We have some difference. These ones are all down here are more common on this. Dots that side of the line are more common on the Puma plot. So there are differences even though these two plots are very close together in the same type of forest. So these four little guys are common everywhere on both plots. They're some of the most common birds around. That guy is the one we catch more often in this nest than any, anybody else in a lot of locations. In contrast, these guys, you don't even know who they are, these two are more common on one of the plots because they like terrain that's a little steeper and there's more of that on the harpia. These two are more common on the other one because of some habitat differences that these guys prefer. So you get these inter uh, differences among species that lead to differences in the overall community composition. So that's at a very local scale. Now at a larger scale, the question is which of these are going to be more similar to each other than the others. So Panama is the closest one, but obviously Panama is in Central America, so you have great filtering effect when you go from South America into Central America. So here's Puma and Peru, the site that John was just talking about. That slope 0.98. So these two sites separate about 1,300 kilometers are basically dominated by the same families of birds, ant birds, flycatchers, tanagers, oven birds, they're all the, the families that are the most important families are most important on both of these plots. They're really very similar. Contrast that to Panama. All these families on this side of the line are more species rich in Ecuador in one of our plots than in Panama. Panama is just not as nice a place to study birds as South America, which is another reason why we left Costa Rica. So that was sort of the distribution pattern, but I also mentioned population dynamics and how things change over time. So this was the first eight years or so, seven years of study, looking at misnet captures. So there's variation. In other words, this is how many birds we catch in the standard sampling effort. So 
the numbers go down, go up, go down, go up. So in 2009, the capture rates were basically the same as they were when we started. So if we had stopped then, gone back and finished up all our papers, we would have said, community is very little bit, but they're pretty stable with the tropics. But we didn't stop then. We kept going. And that's what's happened since then. And capture rates down here are about half of what they were when we started. So this part of the study gives you one result, that part of the study gives you another result. One might argue, somebody could, that we've captured all the birds, they weren't with a missed SR, so they're gone. And that's why it's gone that way. Didn't happen in the first year. And by the way, for that idea, that's what's happened with the observations. So this includes things that are large, they're up in the canopy, parrots, two cans. The numbers that I'm now seeing are here, it's mostly by sound. Within a 100 meter stretch of transect is about half what it was in the first years of this study. So something's going on uh, in this area, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about all the possible reasons, but the likely scenario is climate change. During that subsequent period of time, the numbers of very strong La Nina events increased dramatically, several very severe events. In this part of the world, that means a lot more rainfall is happening during the breeding period. So that can very easily lead to lost reproductive success. And then over time, adult survival is going to go down and things are going to disappear. So that was the bird part. And I'll let you read this. Camera trapping is something that's been going on quite a bit, particularly in the last couple of decades. But it actually has a longer history than this. As Frank Chapman from the American Museum on Barrow, Colorado Island set up these huge box cameras with magnesium flashes and things like this <laughs> and wires stretched across the ground to catch things and something like that. But now we use a little bit more modern techniques to get pictures of the same sort of organisms. And this is something we started in 2004 and one of the main <clears throat> ideas was to include people that are working at the station. I Miguel mean, was the station manager at the time. Diego Mascara is somebody that we work with now. We wanted to include people in this project because of the benefits, potential benefits for conservation. And we wanted to get some data before additional disturbances goes on. Because even though there isn't any disturbance, much of the disturbance right in our area, all this area is an oil concession. And there are roads that have been coming in. Roads, I expect everybody here knows, is, are not very good for conservation for lots of reasons, including increased hunting and so forth. So we've been running these cameras every year since 2004. Uh, most first couple of years we ran them every month for continuously now it's just January and February and you get your typical sorts of things like collar peccaries and white lift peccaries doing what they do to create birds of 100 to 200. You see running around capers, <coughs> deer, you get a variety of birds in the understory but it's mostly uh, mammals you get interesting uh, things that show up. Rob Garaldi was talking about the need for cleaning data as far as latitude and longitude. And from the 1930s, there were 10 records of this technique, or tree graph. And five were Ecuador and five were in Peru. When I looked at the actual locations, two of the Peruvian records were out in the Pacific Ocean. So I'm not exactly sure where they came from. <laughs> <laughs> these were the first uh, photograph of live technique, and we now have videos of these guys as well. So you get cool things like that. This is a canid. This is a short-eared dog. This is the first record of a short-eared dog eating a Sicilian. This is a living with salamander. So you get cool things like that showing up. We are interested in the use of mineral mix or solideros. Animals come in to eat soil and get nutrients with detoxify things. So we have lots of tapers coming into those. We have uh, spider monkeys and counter monkeys that come in. 12, 11 or 12 species of primates at the site. These are the only two that come into mineral lakes, and that's because their diet is uh, 70 or more percent fruit, the spider monkey, and mostly bees for the hammer monkey. And we actually got the first records of these two species in the same photograph, both coming down at the same time, and it's probably because of anti-predator activities of both of them. And we have things like bats that are coming in through the mostly lactating females that come in through the cutting point. Uh, nutrients and minerals, and they can, through some work done in Peru, 
tell perhaps can tell the difference in composition, mineral composition of water, what are known as cold as these little uh, areas of water. So they're detecting differences and focusing on the water on the that. Um, that's your job. Focusing on the water and get the minerals that they need. And you get deer coming through at the same time. So that's what we've been doing. And we've also had a couple of students here. Uh, Matt Hallett, he got his PhD in 2017. He's a WEC student, an SRE student, and a TC student. So he's in everything. Uh, and he's worked in a lot of different places, but he's worked in Guyana for his PhD. He's worked there uh, quite a bit before there. And what he was Internet interested in doing, but a lot was focusing on jaguar conservation, finding out the interactions between jaguars and cows, basically. But he was also very interested in working with local groups. He's working with two indigenous groups uh, in this region, as with the use of camera traps and everything else, that have great success in getting people involved and working with us. And they're doing a lot of the data collection when he's out there. The cameras are still out. Well, for example, he has all these different dots are locations of cameras in the Canuco uh, Mountains where he was working at different, this was just one year of survey. And there are a lot of different communities that are sort of all located around this. And in each of those, he works with different sets of people to come out and do the data collection that goes in with them uh, to do it. And here's another example of, sort of working with local uh, communities Bush dogs, which are these little canids out here, are exceedingly rare and hard to find in tropical forests. There's been huge numbers of lots and lots of camera trap studies with very, very, very few records of bush dog. So Matt, with all his camera traps, which were spread everywhere, had six records, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of camera trap nights, suggesting, well, there's not many bush dogs out there. But he also knows from uh, interactions with lots of people that live there, that they see them more often. So he did interviews with people from villages all across this region and came up with 84 more records of bush dogs with lots of information about their behavior. So by incorporating this local knowledge into their study plan, we learned a lot more than you'd ever learn from six records of camera traps. The other student is Julia Salvador. Uh, she got her master's in 2015, a WEC student and PCE student. She's now working with WCS Ecuador and working with Yasuni National Park. Oh, I forgot to mention that Matt is, I'm not sure what his exact title is, but he's working with both Jacksonville Zoo and the University of Florida uh, going forward. Julia was running the team, the, the tropical ecosystem and monitor, something, Conservation International camera traffic and other study. She was running the cameras around Yasuni Research Station. This is the station run by Catholic University, and it's along the Maxis Road. Ours is 20 kilometers away, not on a road. So she was interested in what the potential impact of this road might be on encounters of all kinds of organisms that she finds with camera traps. She had previously worked with Santiago Espinosa, who got his PhD here, also working in this region, but with camera trapping in different areas to look at the impacts. So these are uh, three different Guarani communities along there that are close to this area of camera trapping, which is looking at what potential impacts of hunting might be. Um, these guys, for example, are really uncommon close to the road. They get more common farther away. These are our preferred target of hunters. We also did a little study with Diego Mosquera from Tiquitini comparing use of mineral licks at Tiquitini, where this is, the mineral licks closer to the road. These guys, for example, never showed up at any of the cameras in the ones near the road. They're basically gone. They're hunted down as are most of the monkeys. 